In 2017, a Redditor shared a recording of a strange game they found along with a cryptic note. As this person's Let's Play grew more and more haunting, viewers found there was much more beneath the surface of this game. Today, we try to uncover the mysteries within Petscop. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to Red Web, the podcast all about internet mysteries, paranormal phenomenon, and unsolved true crime. I am your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins, joining me hearing this mystery for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. I'm hooked. I'm locked in. You Already. subscribe to the channel? Uh, oh, yeah. Hit that like button. <laughs> that thing. Pet Scott. Hit the bell. Um, it's a deep okay. one. So, first off, 2017. Mm -hmm. So, it's more recent. Very. Secondly... Uh, video games, not only video games, which mm -hmm, is close to mm -hmm. our home, but Let's Plays, yep. which uh, in our time, we've created hundreds of. We've made thousands of these yeah. things. So we've we've done a lot in terms of like Let's Plays, video games, streaming it, etc. Mm -hmm. um, also, very curious to see if this was like, what platform was it uploaded to? Was it just YouTube? Was it streamed anywhere? Was it on Twitch? Stuff like, like that. Good like, question. It's this close to home. You know what I I'm love saying? it. See, and it's so, close enough like, that you know all of the instincts around it. Yes. But have you heard of it? No. Yes. That's the other piece that got me. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, how have I not heard of this? Yeah, dude. So there's a lot going on here. There's some sensitive topics we're going to talk about, as always, in the description. But we will also be spoiling the story of Petscop. We're going to go with a quick overview of what Petscop is, the truth behind the game. There is an answer as to what's going on here. If you want, I can go ahead and flag that so you can skip that moment if you want to just indulge in the lore, because after that, we're going to go into further interpretations, further theories behind this game, because there are elements that are still open-ended. And then after that, we're going to dive into a, a real-world true crime case that is referenced in this story. Oh, so this one touches a little bit on everything. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like I said, I'm all in and my mind is already spiraling. Like, you know, what launcher was this game uploaded to? Was it uploaded to a launcher mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. Steam um, or uh, Battle.net? That's um, and then on top of that, like, is was there multiple developers like at Okay, I'm ready. All good questions. I'm <laughs> ready. All very good questions. And just for the sake of uh, the parents at home, my parents in particular, a Let's Play is like gameplay with commentary. Usually very entertaining commentary. Sometimes somebody is very familiar with the game. Sometimes it's comedy. But mm -hmm. in this case, we have a player playing this very mysterious game, and they seem to be speaking to someone in particular, telling their story as to their experience with this game. It's very fascinating. So... Let's go back into the surfacing of these videos. April 8th, 2017, a Reddit user named P.A. Leskowitz shared a video on the Creepy Gaming subreddit, saying this, quote, videos of a mysterious unfinished PSX game from 1997 called Petscop. There's something hiding in it. The link channel was called Petscop, had four videos at the time, and the about page for the channel was blank. A few days later, on April 10th, 2017, the same channel was posted by an anonymous user on a different website called 4chan. They have a similar kind of discussion board method. These also have slashes, but this one was on their video game section called V. And this user said, quote, So apparently someone found this old, unfinished PSX game, game and started recording weird sh happening in it. Three more videos exist of it on the same channel. If anyone is well-versed in how these games were made, technically, can you give some thoughts or whether this looks like an actual PlayStation game? So now that this has surfaced to the internet, let's go back to those videos and begin kind of analyzing them from beginning. So on March 12th, 2017, Petscop uploaded their first video, a nine minute video onto YouTube with a description, quote, the game I found. In the video, we see a PlayStation startup, the logo for the game publisher called Garalina, followed by the game menu for a game called Petscop with the copyright 1997. That is the first image I have for you here. You're going to get a glimpse of the character as well, but we'll talk about him in a second. Petscop. Okay, so questions here. Mm -hmm. There. So were they playing this on, like, console? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. And was it an actual physical copy? 
So that's kind of getting ahead a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. But yeah, I'm trying not to get too ahead. Yeah. But if it's answered later, it's, yeah, okay. we'll get into the realities of this game a little okay, bit. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, but very good questions because these are the same questions that as people were first getting into them in 2017, these are the questions people were asking. Right. It's like, what can is, I buy this? Right. Or is, it, or is it just like something that's like, if it was. Because, you know, the gaming consoles, they have, like, an official store. Mm -hmm. It's not like the internet where it's like, you just get it anywhere. They have official stores because they run on their, you know, a Sony PlayStation runs on a Sony PlayStation operating system. 100%. Um, and so it'd be like something that Sony is officially, like, passed to be like, oh, it's all good to go into the store because they uh, monitor that stuff. Right. So I will spill some beans okay. because it doesn't answer the question just yet. But this is very similar to Lost Media, which is a whole genre online. We did an episode on the most mysterious song on the internet, which is a song that caught people by storm, but no one knows who made it. We did a whole episode on that, yeah, that's right. I believe, almost three years ago, Jeez. May 2021. So this basically is some of the initial rumblings. Is this lost media? Was this game real? Was it not? If it is real, who made it? Why did it disappear? Because clearly someone's playing what looks like a very valid game. Yeah. So those are great questions to be having. So, like I said, we see that we see the startup, and then the the player begins to play. Now, the person making the video entered the name Paul in the game's text box for the player name. Much like Pokemon, you you pick a name, and then they yeah. call you that throughout the game. So that's what everyone began calling this YouTuber, Paul. So in this video, Paul said, "quote This is just to prove to you that I'm not lying about this game that I found." It's unclear on who he intended this video to be for, but he's talking to a person very clearly. Until later on, we will acknowledge someone specifically, and we know who he's talking to, but that won't be for several videos later. I believe there are, correct me if I'm wrong, Christian, like 24 episodes of this? I do not remember the number off the top of my head. I don't know why it's, I'm blanking on it. It's a wild number. This is a very in-depth thing. That 24. Yeah, there's 24. This, is, this, is, this one's going to be a long ride. Huh? It's a very dense one. Now, are sure. these videos still up? Yes, they are. Okay. Yeah, and they continued to be posted for a few years after this. But Paul explained that the game is unfinished and that he wanted to show us his first and only level before getting into something more interesting. So in Petscop, the player controls a very bizarre creature. They've got no arms, two very large feet, and they walk around. They can't really do anything other than pick up the in-game currency, which looks kind of like multicolored polygons. Uh, you see the character in front of you. Mm -hmm. I described them to Jillian as kind of a beige Darth Vader looking thing. I can see that. You know, like yeah. a little stormtrooper shaped head. Yeah, look at that big dome. Yeah, and he's kind of yellowish. Like a helmet. It is like a helmet. Handsome. To someone. It's this mom. To mom. <laughs> yeah. A face that maybe only mom could love. But, but anyway, uh, the character's yellowish hue kind of contrasts with the otherwise bright and colorful environment. As you can kind of see from the title screen, uh, some bright purples, pinks, blues. Seems like a very bright and shiny game, but the yeah. character a little bit more drab. Was this like a, a, a gift box behind the logo and it's got a bow tie in it and uh, the t the... The title of the game and the box is like on a road or a bridge. It does, yeah, it looks like a little like bridge. A walkway. When you said gift box, I was like, how do you know? He's reading ahead. He's psychic. And then I forgot. He's It's right, it's there. right there. It's a clue <laughs> in the title screen that I honestly oh. never really like processed. It's an element to the game. And there's so okay. many little nuggets in this very dense game. And, and I'm going to go ahead and say this here and now. We're going to cover as much as one can. Okay. But if you That's really want to go deep, lot. I highly encourage you, Task Force, to go online. There are hours, I mean, multiple hours long video essays going even deeper. So we're going to give as much as we can in this run. Uh, we're going to be very thorough. But if you really want that deep, in the nitty gritty breakdowns of every single gameplay that was posted, definitely go look those up after this episode to get even more context. So in Petscop's soul level, a number of creatures are called pets that were abandoned within the building of the area called the Gift Plane, P-L-A-N-E. Basically, this is a pet catching game, kind of like Pokemon, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But there's a sign in the game within this building that reads, quote, Don't be discouraged if they run from you. They really do want a home. They're afraid. Show them that there's nothing to be afraid of. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, usually, I mean, there are games, where you, like you said, like Pokemon, where you catch stuff. And... They just, you just kind of just do, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. This is like very creepily telling you they want to be caught. Right. They might run and scream, but, but they want to be caught. Yeah, but it's, it's what they want. Right. That's creepy. We know what they want. Yeah. So anyway, 
Each pet seems to have some sort of unique puzzle in order to catch them. For example, there's a rain cloud pet that the only way to catch it is to put a metal bucket underneath it. So that way, when the rain drops, it hits the bucket instead of the dirt, at which point it would have run away. But otherwise, the bucket catches it, so it can't leave. Okay. The pets are all unique and don't resemble traditional pets, as you can imagine. We got a rain cloud. These aren't like cats and dogs. These are, again, kind of more like Pokemon. For example, there's another pet that's like a giant rock. Okay, pet so, rock. So, pet rock. There is only one pet in the end that player Paul was unable to catch, for what it's worth. It's probably the Mew of the game. You just got to push yeah. the van yep. right there by SS Ann. You're going to get it. It's a very rare one. Mm-hmm. However... This is not the only part of Petscop that Paul was interested in showing the viewer, whoever he was talking to. And he mentioned that he had received a note with the game, and I'm so excited to finally read this. It says, quote, I walked downstairs, and when I got to the bottom, instead of proceeding, I turned to the right and became a shadow monster man. 6 97 for you. Please go to my website on the sticker, and also go to Roneth's room and press start, and press down, 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 right, start. End quote. So Paul enters this cheat code, as it seems, written on the note, which then alters the environment of Petscop. When Paul's character leaves the main building, the outside goes from colorful and cute to now dark, dreary, and empty. And when you look at it, it almost looks like a dark fog. So you can kind of see the, the green grass in your immediate vicinity, yeah. but it immediately fades away. And you, you feel whatever, like, lassophobia, the fear of the ocean, if, whatever the opposite of claustrophobia is, is what I feel when I see that. You just oh, feel like you're in open this... open space. Yes. Like you've referenced before, Silent Hill. Mm-hmm, 100%. So now the game has shifted. Paul's character always kind of felt like this kind of a little bit more dreary character. Now the environment is matching that. So at this point, Paul can only find a single brick building and grass. But eventually, Paul discovers something else, a door that at first he could not open. He left the game running. We don't really know exactly what he was doing or why he left it running and recording, but... At some point, uh, I, I believe it might have been a few hours, the door opened on its own. And that is what we see in the second episode, in what's called Petscop 2. Each iteration of these videos is Petscop 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, very simple. Um, but this is the first instance where we see the game do something on its own, and he recounts how long he had let the game go, but we don't see all that, uh, okay. that runtime. He just kind of commentates, well, I guess this door is open now. Yeah. And so he proceeds. As Paul uploaded more editions of this very eerie Let's Play series, he and the viewers discovered that something much more complicated seemed to be going on in this unfinished pet collecting game. Something else seemed to be behind Petscop. Each video is simply titled, as I mentioned, Petscop, followed by its order number. And as of today, there are 24 episodes, and the final episode was uploaded in 2019. So, a couple years. A couple years ago. It's possible. I mean, that was a two year run. It's possible that even though it's been almost five years now that more episodes might come out. There are hints to indicate that that we'll get to eventually. What? But but yeah, it's... Man, I'm so excited to not only get... Okay. I hope this doesn't deflate the, the story here to kind of analyze the truth behind it because there are still so many elements to this... to this story, to this pet scop that make it so intriguing and more open-ended. So a lot of people are still theorizing on this to this day. But with that said, if you want to skip ahead and you don't want to listen to maybe some of the true background to this, kind of buzz forward maybe 10 or so minutes in this episode. Five to 10 minutes. Five minutes, you're, you're probably safe. 10 minutes, I don't know. I can't see the future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm just giving that caveat in case you want to like live and immerse yourself in only the unknown, only the Got storytelling, it. and you want to kind of confront this as people did in, in 2017. I don't think that this robs the story of any intrigue. I think it actually adds. So with that said, with that caveat task force, let's talk about it. So unfiction, is this a term you've ever heard of before? Unfiction? No. Unfiction. I have not. I'm very excited that we're finally broaching the subject. We've, we've come very close to it before in a lot of episodes. Uh, ARGs have been argued to be a subcategory of unfiction, but let's dive into it. So when you search the game publisher, Garolina, that you see at the beginning of the game, it yields no conclusive results. As one would continue deeper into the lore and the mysteries of Petscop, this is where I want to kind of explain that despite how real it feels as a video series, it feels authentic, that this person is reacting in real time, that something eerie is going on, this is all made up. As of 2019, the web series Petscop had a creator that came forward, Tony Domenico, aka 
pressed yes on Twitter, aka X, and Tony didn't reveal himself until the very end there, 2019. But up until that point, it was unconfirmed whether or not Petscop was fiction or real in some sense. But Petscop is an example of what is called unfiction. It's an emerging and popular genre on the internet. And it's very similar to ARGs where the story feels real, like it exists in its own reality. Though some experts in the genre, like Nightmind, argue that ARGs are kind of a subset of unfiction. Basically to say that all ARGs are unfiction, but not all unfiction are ARGs. ARGs kind of interact with an audience. There are steps that the audience has to take to unfold the next piece of the puzzle or story. Sometimes it reacts to people's involvement. This, or I guess uh, unfiction in general, is more of a alternate reality they treat that as the reality, but it's agnostic to your involvement. It's more of a something to watch happen. Yeah. Okay. That's more my speed thing, because I'm not smart enough to figure out ARGs. Hmm. I mean, that's fair. But a little fun fact before we continue, um, a common way to describe unfiction, ARGs, things like that, fiction that insists its reality is the real reality, is a phrase called, this is not a game, not in parentheses. This quote, this concept was made popular actually by the lead developers of the I Love Bees ARG, hey. Ellen Lee, which we covered. We did a whole episode discussing that Halo 2 ARG. It was like a marketing campaign. It was very yeah. fascinating. But anyway, a little fun fact. But again, unfictions are not influenced by audiences, much like ARGs are. So in our interpretation, it's sort of where ARGs kind of meet creepypasta, which are just kind of Inspired by the term copy-paste, copy-pasta, creepy-pasta. It's just spooky stories that one shares. An example of this that most people would be familiar with, I would imagine, you especially, Fredo, would be The Blair Witch Project. It's a found footage horror film. And this seems to be like an early... Some people consider this to be the initial unfiction, where they kind of... It seems very much slice of life, like these are people just doing their thing, and that this was a found tape but it's actually like a different reality, but they're treating it like, you know what I mean? Yes, but they're treating it like it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that kicked off uh, all the found footage stuff. Oh yeah. Paranormal activity, going gym, finally saw that. That was, dude, uh, it was going gym, haunted asylum. It's yeah. a found footage Ooh. film from- uh, South Korea. South Korea, but yeah. it came out like 2017, I think. 2017. Around there. Um, Petscop connection the, win, 2017. The last, <laughs> 20 minutes is probably the best found footage I've uh, ever seen. The oh. last 20 minutes is like perfection. Terrifying, man. Yeah. It's it is so it is very good. terrifying. Yeah. At the end. yeah. I'm just looking back and forth, Task Force, because I'm <laughs> in with my boys. We'll get this man on it. Yeah. Um, I told Alfredo about this movie months ago at this point. I'm so glad you finally yeah. watched it. Okay, but Blair Witch got to be on that list. But yes. Blair Witch also had other things too beyond the found footage. They had like websites to help it feel more real, oh. uh, news clips, posters, all sorts of things that were part of their marketing campaign. But um, I do want to give a huge shout out to the task force. We did an episode on The Bridge a few weeks ago. Yes. And a lot of people pointed out that perhaps that was an example of unfiction. We kind of fell into that camp without the right terminology. But basically, that is to say that the bridge itself might be real. The mysterious items that we discussed being in there may have been placed by the original person who, air quotes, found it. And they were creating a compelling story, an eerie feeling. So basically, it's that that alternate reality kind of melds into ours. A little matrixy, a little creepy. Yeah. They don't have to be unfiction. doesn't have to be horror or creepy. It just tends to be because I think it elicits more emotion. But but yeah, I think that's an amazing theory, Task Force. Now, unfiction may or may not have an ending or an explanation. There are many things about the feeling and suspension of disbelief, because obviously if you look a lot closer, you're going to start like going, oh, you're going to be going to be the wet blanket of it all. <laughs> it's one of those things where you got to like <laughs> suspend that disbelief and, and allow this other reality to feel yeah. real. Because then it, then it has a much more firm effect. Which is the... The mindset that I take when we go on ghost hunts. Yeah. Do I believe that ghosts are spectral entities and spirits are real? No. Do I feel like I want to test that out? No. Mm-hmm. But when I'm there, I allow myself to get immersed into the atmosphere and I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I feel similarly. It's yeah. it's nice to like, don't come in with your preconceived notions yeah. and your biases. Like, let's actually analyze it and try to yep. debunk what we can. And if we can't, we can't. That's true. Um, and that's what we, you know, that's what we do. So... Petscop 
just for what it's worth, it's not actually playable, to answer your question. Oh. But Paul, that gameplay and his discoveries are kind of the storytelling method. Viewers learn the story as Paul learns the story, essentially. However, Petscop apparently is a game. So it's not playable because it's not public, but it is, I guess, a game that Domenico created using Game Maker, which is a game engine that uses a drag and drop development system. So it's a little bit more easily uh, used and accessed. But basically, it seems like he did actually build the game in order to get the footage to tell the story. So is it real? Technically, yes. Is it real in the broad, traditional published Boys, sense? Yeah. Not really. No. Oh. There are fan created versions of it if you wanted to get in that way. Oh, interesting. But yeah, Not otherwise, yeah. Now, this kind of playable version that Domenico has apparently is a file that only exists on his personal computer. And this is all according to the gaming news source EGM. So while Pets Cop series did end November 28th, 2019, the community still has countless theories as to what this story is about. There's a lot of interpretations. There's a lot of material. I mean, a lot of material. Yeah. Fascinating, eerie, unsettling vague enough, but also like some of it pointed. It, it's very interesting, but it goes very, very deep. To learn more about Petscop and to see other theories, interpretations, there is an active Reddit, there's a Discord, and as I mentioned, a bunch of video essays out there. In fact, there's a very helpful, quote, progress doc that was made by Noel Sharp and others from the community. And there's even a special viewer by X Keeper, which can help viewers see things hidden in the darkness and kind of help boost the contrast to see what's going on in the loading screens, little Easter eggs and things There's like that. There's stuff hidden behind loading oh, screens? Oh, yeah. A little terrifying. Yeah. It's very thoughtful. Very, I think, well put together. Yeah. I mean, I could see why. It's perfect. It's, it's the perfect type of thing for Reddit, for the internet, because they're just going to, you know, time and time again, you throw a little crumb and they're, they're trying to find their way to that cookie. Right. <laughs> the whole I'm gonna thing. I'm going to turn this crumb into a cookie. <laughs> yeah. And then I want to have it and eat it. it yep. Yeah, they're going to tear into it. Yes. And that's what I love about internet mysteries. I yeah, love that that's, it's they're going to tear in and figure it out. It's a whole new, like, one, it's like, I feel like the future, right? Mm -hmm. Just technology, the next internet. Frontier. Yeah, exactly. And then, two, it's just fascinating how quickly different minds can come together. We've seen it time and time again. And uh, now I'm just waiting to see when i mean we've had some stories about like email haunted emails and stuff like that but like you know as technology evolves you know if they can haunt a candle you know yeah. why not haunt your phone or something right. like that yeah 100 percent. all right so it's been about 10 minutes as of recording so hopefully if you're looking for the deeper story you've popped back in right now you this is just my good spot my vocal chapter i yeah. wish we i mean i wish we could fly we can flag chapters on youtube but we can't really do that on podcast platforms but Let's now dive into the expanded lore to kind of lay the bed for some of the other theories, interpretations. And then again, we're going to come around to the very, almost in your face, reference to a true crime, like a real true crime case. Okay. All right. So in the following installments of Pets Cop, Paul explores the area beneath the enigmatic door, which we find later is called the Newmaker Plain. This area has buildings made of brick or concrete and seemingly endless hallways. Again, you feel very lost, like you're in the void very much the upside down kind of feeling. The only light seems to emanate from the player character and many spaces appear empty, save for the collectibles. Now, the first landmark that Paul finds at this point is back outside, though it's still dark, he's able to see a grave with a house on its right. Both are gray with simple face designs. The grave is shaped like a gift box, the one that you pointed out on the front cover. This grave says, quote, Mike Hammond, 1988 to 1995. Mike was a gift. Now, some buff mathematicians out there might have noticed that that's a gravestone for a seven-year-old. Wow. Yeah. As Paul explores further, there are more cryptic puzzles. These puzzles and new characters Paul encounters all have a very melancholic vibe, very unsettling. But after Paul finds a giant daisy, he plucks all the petals off of it, and he discovers a girl called Care, C-A-R-E. And she goes from crying to red, completely distorted and pixelated. So again, I'm jumping a few details here, but suffice to say that Paul finds this giant flower and begins plucking off yeah. the petals. Later on in episode eight, Paul makes it clear that his mother had the game at one point in time. And so perhaps he found it among her personal effects. Either way, this continues to firm up the lore outside of the game. There seems to be something going on, not only with the game, but also Paul's real world relationships. And basically this is where we start to see the theme increase in relevancy, where 
Something in Paul's real life and his relationships are impressing upon the game, or perhaps vice versa. It starts to get oh. a little, a little hairy. Yeah, the lines are blurring. Yeah. So we'll explore that a lot more here in a bit. But in June of 2017, after episode 10, the channel got a new description. It said, air quotes, Rainer gave this gift to us on Christmas 1997 and 2000. It was the single longest day of our lives. We were all certain he was dead at the time. He had been missing since June 1997 and 2000. We're not as concerned about these things now. Please enjoy the recordings. We do. With a little smiley face. In episode 11, Paul says he found his room and he calls his friend on the phone to tell her that she doesn't have one since she's not technically family. We later find out that the friend that he called in that episode was Belle. She's the person that Paul had initially been making these videos for, so whenever he's talking to the camera or saying you, we now know retroactively that oh. it's always been about Belle. She's the one he's been talking to in the commentary, albeit vaguely up until this point. So as Paul gets further into the game, he realizes there are connections between the in-game story and his real life. Now he's aware of them, though he doesn't remember Care or the person Care going missing. Jumping ahead a bit, but one of the characters is actually called Lena Leskowitz, which is very similar, if not the same, as the Reddit username that presumably Paul had posted under, which was P.A. Leskowitz. So the audience learned that someone named Rainer made the game Petscop for a specific family, possibly the Leskowitz family, who are most likely Paul's extended family. From Rainer's in-game text, the audience loosely learned about a character named Marvin. Marvin seems to be the main family member the game was created for. And this is where I, I'll admit, we start to get a little hairy, a little lost. So pause me if you get confused. Yeah. I can always uh, reiterate, but- the Strings are going different directions. Oh, this is a deep and tangled web. So Marvin's childhood friend, Lena, disappeared or died, question mark, when they were friends. Marvin married Lena's sister. When they had a daughter, Marvin believed that this was Lena reborn. His daughter is called Care in Petscop. Later, Marvin kidnaps his own daughter to hide her in an abandoned school. These so-called real-world events are then repeated in the game of Petscop. That's eerie. Yeah. So, again, we have an unfiction universe, right? But we also have the blending of what seems to be happening outside the game, blending with the game. Which one's taking first? Which? Was it made accordingly? Was one mirroring the other naturally? Those are the questions we don't really know. I mean... That's just very eerie because in the sense of like, I mean, you know, uh, uh, we play a lot of video games or Task Force, if you play a lot of video games, just imagine how good some of the graphics are for these games where it looks so realistic and how violent some of these games can be. Mm -hmm. Like imagine playing some kind of shooter where you're tearing into somebody with bullets or bashing someone's head. That's These are things that are not uncommon in video games. Video games can be very violent. That's why they have different ratings. Um, to inform parents and to keep children from playing, you know, certain games, but they can get very, very violent. Imagine if you're just, you know, get gruesome, bashing someone's head in. It's very vivid. The graphics are really good. And you come to find out that this happened in real life. Yeah. That this person's face that you're just like, oh, it's just a random computer person that I'm beating up was an actual person in real life. And mm -hmm. it's like the career of the game mimicked that. That's terrifying. Yeah. And this seems to be, and I don't remember the timeline specifically, but if it was in the game after it happened in real life or alongside, that's the thing is this game being old, it's hard to know right. which came first or if the game was actively I, mirroring God. this reality. Cause I didn't even think about that. Because yeah. what if it was the reverse or in the game you're committing a crime, mm -hmm. but like technically that crime didn't happen yet, right? That could be the person saying, this is the crime I'm gonna commit and this is what I'm gonna mm -hmm. do it to. And it's like a minority, minority report yeah. type of thing. Oh, God, it's terrible. Yeah. And it's also... <laughs> I've never thought about it like that ever. Yeah. It's deeply unsettling. It's a fascinating story element, but it also adds to, again, the confusion because there's a lot going on here. Yeah. A lot going on. But let's dive deeper still. So in-game, Marvin and the Tool, there's a new character. We don't know if they're a person or if they're an entity, but they're kind of like... They're like the silhouette of Tingle from Legend of Zelda. It's almost like a two ball snowman with a long cone on top. It's just like kind of a shape. Anyway, they're called Tool. That's how we'll refer to them. But this is an entity which players can ask simple questions. They can basically type in a, not like multiple choice, they can type in a question to ask Tool and then Tool will respond. 
But anyway, Marvin and Tool tell Paul to help Marvin find his house and find a windmill, both of which are on the Newmaker plane. So as he does, Paul finds more clues about the mysteries in Petscop and those of his own family. This is very reductive, but basically a lot of the major themes, as you can imagine, are like childhood, rebirth, attachment theory, trauma, abuse, and then other elements are talked about gifts, doors, and time. Again, very much simplifying, but those seem to be the cascade of themes underlying the story. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp. A common misconception about relationships is that they have to be easy to be right. But sometimes the best ones happen when both people put in the work to make them great. Therapy can be a great place to work through the challenges you face in all of your relationships, whether with friends, work, your significant other, or anyone. Therapy is a wonderful place to have a safe space to talk about things that you want to work through and process, and it's great to have a licensed professional expert be able to help you navigate the trials and tribulations of mental health. It is an absolutely invaluable resource everybody should take advantage of if they feel they can benefit from it. If you're thinking about starting therapy, BetterHelp is a great option. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient and flexible. All you have to do is fill out a survey and they'll match you with a licensed therapist. Plus, you can switch therapists at any time. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash RedWeb today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash RedWeb. This episode of RedWeb is sponsored by Shopify. Selling a little or a lot? Shopify helps you do your thing however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. And you can sell more with less efforts thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S., Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. The Red Web storefront utilizes Shopify, and it's a wonderful, easy-to-use, user-friendly experience. And the Red Web team is extremely satisfied with what we have going on with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash redweb, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash redweb now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash redweb. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Henson Shaving. Are you all too familiar with the pains of using a cheap razor or the annoyance of subscription razors? That's where Henson Shaving comes in. Henson Shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer that has made parts for the ISS, that's the International Space Station, and Mars Rover, and now they are bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience. By using aerospace-grade CNC machines, Henson makes metal razors that extend just 0.0013 inches, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. That means a secure and stable blade with a vibration-free shave, and it gets better. The razor has built-in channels to evacuate hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. I love the precision and the care that Henson puts into their razors. It is so much better than any typical subscription or cheap razor that you'll find somewhere else. I absolutely love it. It's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that'll last you a lifetime. Visit HensonShaving.com RedWeb to pick the razor for you and use code RedWeb and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just to make sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G dot com slash RedWeb and use code RedWeb. With that said, we've gotten a little deeper into the lore. We know kind of the origin of the storytelling. But again, there's so many details and so many things still left uninterpreted that the community is still active and thriving and theorizing and it is theorized that Petscop the game is actually haunted or cursed in some way, beyond just the unfiction, perhaps storytelling of it all, which it is a natural thing that people will like, you know, yeah. steer into. Um, yeah, 100%. It's unfortunate that this isn't a public game. Mm hmm. Um, just because with video games in general, uh, people find every little nuance. I mean, there's channels dedicated to like, 
finding every little nook and cranny of a video game. But every now and then, there'll be something that's discovered in a video game that was 10, 20 years old. Yeah. You know? Um, like the first Easter egg. Exactly. Do you, you know about that? Uh, no, no, not that one. I don't remember. The, okay, I, I'm going to do this not so much justice, but I just remember it was an old game, and it was definitely a top-down kind of like run-around game, but very pixelated. Don't remember the name. Either way, you're a character, and you kind of run into this maze, and if you go to a very specific spot, yes. in just in the wall and tap A, you'll grab a little yellow pixel out of the wall, yes. and if you run that all the way back to where your character starts, I remember that. you get... I don't know if it was like a special credits or something like you yeah. get an Easter egg and that wasn't found for years after the game came Very out. long time. And it's also so obscure, so deep cut that yes, in, unless the game is in the hands of the public yeah. and the people are tearing it apart, tearing into it, trying to figure it out. Yep. Those are the details that will forever stay asleep. You yes, know what I mean? Exactly. I would love for you to help me with the details, Christian, because... For it, just it's, look it's up the a, first Easter egg, first video no, game exactly Easter egg. What talking about because it's can't. so deep in the crevices of my memory. Same. That's all I'm not doing it justice. Went, wow, the first Easter egg. Yeah, really adventure. Cool. So I think so. The first recorded video game Easter egg was in the game Adventure in 1979. Yeah, dude. Yes, I think so. Man, someone thought to do that. I'm gonna put a little pixel here, and if someone comes to this spot and hits A, it's so cool. cool. And then and just knows what to do with it. I, I got this little block. I what do I do? Never. Yeah. I've ever found that. Was it this? This game? Like real top down, like the Yeah, gray. it's an Atari 2600. Yeah. 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 That's, That's adventure. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very top down old school, I uh, reference Zelda again, where you're almost like dungeon crawling. When you hit mm -hmm. the south side of the screen, it scans south and you have a new grid to look at. Anyway, let's now talk about kind of the story elements and lore elements that go into the idea of this being a haunted or cursed game. Because what I find so fascinating about this theory is that Paul himself in the episodes is talking about that. He's he's openly musing on his thoughts of this being haunted or being an AI or being some sort of intelligence that, you know, and, and he gives his own thoughts on it. So we'll get there. But in later chapters of Petscott, Paul leaves the game idle because remember, early on he idled the game and it kind of did its own thing. It opened a door that he couldn't open. And so he kind of does that a few more times. And each time he does that, it seems to take on a mind of its own. Other characters seem to appear and have control over the space, and the main other player, Marvin, leaves a message for Paul to find his house. Basically, some of the things that happen when he Got it. leaves the game and comes back. The game has done something. It's just, it's so cool. Yeah. Uh, but also at the same time, it's like, how creepy would you ever... Hell. Creepy as hell. And how would you ever... You know what I mean? Imagine you're playing uh, Sonic Adventure 2 Battles, right? Rolling around at the speed of... Pause. Got a Hot Pocket to eat. Right. I'm got I got a late lunch, you know. I was gaming too long. You come back, Sonic is somewhere else right. in a dark alley it's looking dark, right at the camera waving at you. Tones shifted uh -huh. differently. You're not collecting rings, you're collecting skulls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like what is happening? <laughs> that would throw you off so bad. It's pretty cool. So I mean as, you know, we are all, all gamers in this room. Mm -hmm. It's very very fascinating. Man, hats off to to Paul for pushing forward, but because Paul realized the game opened the door to the new maker playing on his own, he always leaves the PlayStation and Petscop running. It's, I think it's a good tactic, good science move, though he wasn't always recording. In an attempt to get further insight from the game's own actions, just to see what the game would do. Now, regarding the figure in the game called Tool, Paul asks it a string of simple questions. At one point, Tool changes color and then tells Paul to turn off the PlayStation instead of answering what his question was. And then it says, quote, Marvin, dot, dot, dot hurts me when PlayStation on. Otherwise, Tool does seem to answer the questions that are given to him in a kind of pre-written sort of format. But this one time, he refers to always being on and says that this Marvin character hurts him when you're away. I don't like that. Turn me off. I don't like that at all. Also, I could not give you a direction that I, I would go in. Sledgehammer to the top of the system. Elbow from the top ropes. I mean, this system's got to go. Christian nods yes. I feel like you put it on a different system, see what happens? Mm. You clone it and then put it back out into the wild. No. Like that's, the ring. That's the ring. You don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> then again, I don't know. Well, talk to me again when I have 24 hours left on the clock. <laughs> Yikes, dude. Yeah. So kind of moving on. That was just like another piece of the element. Here's yeah. another element here. Just to, there's a 
gap in time here. So Paul found a room that seems to be mirrored on the other side of the screen. This is called the quitter's room. I actually have an image for you to kind of take a look at. Quitter's room. Yeah. So he walks in from the from the right side of the screen, and on the left half is a room perfectly mirrored. And as he moves around, this other entity that's on the other side of this mirror in the quitter's room perfectly matches him. Their movements are perfectly synced until suddenly the person on the other side of the mirror stops moving in sync and starts doing their own actions. Oh, hell no. Paul doesn't know what to make out of this, doesn't know what to do with the interactions. He believes that because in this moment, he's talking to the camera or talking to perhaps Belle, but he's saying he doesn't know or he doesn't believe perhaps that this game is haunted unless he received more immediate responses. Basically, Paul openly muses that a truly haunted game would have quicker, more relevant responses. Yeah than what he seems to be experiencing. Yeah, what he's, he's experiencing is probably a little bit more generic. A little more pre-written, a little bit more like using the confines of the of the game to yeah. push forward. So maybe it's like scripted or coded, a little bit kind of like Bandersnatch where you right. can kind of make decisions and it feels bespoke. So he's kind of saying, I don't think it's haunted, but yeah. that's kind of introducing the idea. Yeah, like if you're playing a game that's all about solving math equations and you have all these uh, math questions, you can't necessarily say it's haunted, even if they seem out of place or accurate. Mm-hmm. Now, he starts asking you and talking about certain, I don't know, public events or things that are going on in your life. Yes, take a sledgehammer to it, burn it, mm-hmm. and then send it to somebody else. Yeah. Cast the curse down. Yeah. Send it to the county over. Let them do the autopsy. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, book club reference. You might not understand unless you become an elite member. Or you do and you're... Redwebpod.com slash first. that's why you're elite. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's another instance here. He kind of openly muses on that. But again, there are countless instances where it does seem to react to him in a more uh, specific, nuanced way. But starting in episode nine, the audience began to be shown what seems to be demo recordings of the game interspersed with Paul's actual gameplay. So if you remember sitting on title screens of games, sometimes it would just start playing. It would show, like Mario games do this, yeah. where it just shows Mario running through the level, and that's considered like a demo screen. You're not playing, it's kind of just a pre-existing- like a little showcase. Yeah, I don't know if it's actually like a video or if it's just the, the computer game itself running through itself, I don't know, but Either way, some of those are interspersed into his Let's Play. And some of the players in these recordings seem to go to locations that Paul has yet to find. So these demo screens are a way for the story to move forward, to show other things that the game is basically saying, like, look at these other things you haven't found yet, right? Oh, see, I like that because, you know, some, uh, I'm, I don't, look, I look up guides. Sure. Nintendo mm. Power. Yeah. You GM, know. I mean, we talked about earlier, tr- yep. Electronic Gaming Monthly, mm-hmm. or just a Wikipedia about the game. Yeah. Because there's a lot. Some of these games are massive, expansive. And, and honestly, like with something like this, um, even as like not even just a person playing the game, but as the viewer, I would like the person to find every nook and cranny. Yeah. And put it in the Let's Play. 100%. So those are fascinating. You, I'm, gl- I'm glad you like that part. Would you like this part? Oh, these demo screens seem to be communicating with Paul through in game text. Somehow knowing that he is recording and when he is recording. Okay. Basically, no, the like, demos are putting on a show. He, yeah. They're like, oh, you're recording? Let me do something different. All right. When he's recording, that's interesting. Yeah. Because there was there was an enemy in Metal Gear Solid that was a PlayStation game that would um, start giving out your information, like your birthday and stuff like that. But it would Weird. read the memory card on the system. Oh, mm-hmm. that's in- yeah. that's creepy. Which back then, and everyone was like, "Wow, that's creepy! How do you know that?" And it's like, "Oh, it's just reading like the data on the console that you entered." Weren't in. there storylines too about like emerging AI and and things like that mm-hmm. in Metal Gear that are kind of like prescient today? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep, for sure. I gotta play those games. But coming back to the demos for a second, when the demos are the only new videos on the channel. The description seems to change, and it says that these are select recordings of Petscop we wish to show you. So now what we're seeing in the language of the YouTube channel is that the word we is coming forward. We always kind of thought that this was Paul's channel. Paul was making these things. Yep. There's now an unknown other entity kind of calling it we. And later on, oh, actually, I'll just say it now. Paul was resistant to the arrangement, supposedly, until it was, quote, settled. 
And so we don't know who this person is yet. I think that's part of the unsolved nature of this story and this mystery. But it's deeply unsettling that something now, either in his real life or in this game, is interfacing with him off video. And now this this YouTube channel is shared by both Paul and this entity this, yeah. or this unknown person. That's creepy, man. Very creepy. That's very, very creepy. These are the select recordings we wish to show you. Paul didn't like it at first, and so, well, we had a settlement, an arrangement. Like, that sounds so weird. It could be. that It's very weird, and you could take it so many different ways. This could be an actual other person. This could be yeah. an entity. Which is um, worse. Exactly. You know? That, I don't know. Or it could be another Paul in Paul's head. Ooh. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, that's, oh, that's, <laughs> you're right. Man, scrambles, scrambles out here. But viewers also discovered that there are earlier, quote, generations of the game in these demos after episode 17. So now we're deep into. Okay, 17 out of 24. Mm -hmm. Okay. But. It seems that, like, through these demos, we're getting glimpses into previous iterations of this Petscop game. We even see a list of demo recording files, and some of them are named after the people who played them. This is why some of the name dropping we did earlier is a little overwhelming, a little confusing. It's going to come to fruition here momentarily. But one of these demo recording files was called Belle, and the game directly addresses her. Again, Belle is the one that Paul is making these videos for. She's the one that he's talking to. Now, in this recording, it says, quote, I'm calling you Belle because that's who you are. You might be confused as to what happened. I was over eager before and started calling you Tiara prematurely. We see another one of these demo recording files that Paul plays. Now, in this recording, he's on the phone with his friend Belle once again. Paul claims in this recording, in this phone call with Belle, that he was not recording the game or his audio. He's basically like, don't worry, this isn't part of the video. This, I'm not recording this. But somehow, obviously, this was captured. Obviously, this was recorded. And so the question has to be asked, was Paul lying? Or was this, again, the game reacting to real life? Did the game somehow know to record itself along with the call? Hence why we have the call overlaying the game footage. Another kind of point in a lot of people's column for this being a haunted kind of paranormal game behind it all. In another one of these demo recording files, Paul asks, tool where the windmill scene in the game actually was. Like, where can I find this windmill? And it gave him what seemed to be coordinates, though, of course, the new channel owners censored this. Again, what? this is like, whoever these we, this other person is, is now helping control this narrative. So now yeah. something in the real world is helping control things like the game is slightly doing. But isn't Paul the one uploading all this? That's what we thought. Yeah. And now there seems to be another channel owner that Paul didn't like, but that's when they came to this like kind of settlement. Yeah. So Paul told the person on the phone in this recording, again, Bell, that he planned to go to the location of the coordinates along with Bell. At this point, Paul seemed to start solving the mystery within Petscop and within his family. When Bell stops speaking on the other end, a character on screen attempts to interact with Paul, again, highlighting this interface between real life and the game. Either the game is influencing the real world or the real world is influencing the game. That's the mystery at hand here. And after this call, we primarily only hear from Paul through in-game text, and this is how he communicates with Marvin. Marvin's responses appear in real time and do not seem to be pre-written, which was the criteria Paul gave earlier for tools answers. And this was kind of why he believed it wasn't haunted. They seem to be pre-written, therefore it can't be haunted, or some sort of AI. Yeah. But now this flies in the face of that. So Paul's beginning to kind of maybe question the reality behind this game. In Petscop 16, we are shown a burn-in monitor with an alert sound that reads, quote, No controller input has been detected for a very long time. Family, neighbors, police, or whoever, keep game console running. Call provided phone number. And I have that warning screen for you as well. What? And as always, Task Force, these images will be on our social media handles at Red Web Pod and also available with a quick Google search if you prefer. Yeah, no controller input has been detected for a very long time. So either it was never connected or it was left on for so long it disconnected. Mm -hmm. Family, neighbors, police, or whoever. Keep console running. Call provided phone number. Well, like it's like a phone booth or speed situation here where it's like, don't slow down the bus. Something mm. bad's going to happen. Don't step out of that phone booth. Something bad's going to happen. And here, keep the console on. Right. Or else. 
someone in the game, Tool, is going, please stop the game. It hurts us, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the game itself going, keep us going, call this number, which obviously we censored out, but, or w was that censored out by the owners of the channel as well? Christian, do we know that part? Or that, we I don't out? know. I think it was censored by the, the owners of the channel. Got it. Either way, immediately following this alert, there is a room from above showing someone moving about the room. So maybe the game is able to track the location of the players. We don't know. In episode 20, we are shown four caskets, and these are items in the game that, if seen, can make anyone, quote, family. I know it's a bit strange, but okay. later, Paul comes across one of these four caskets, and Marvin asks through text, quote, which room are you in? There are eight images on the walls of different room layouts with a bed and a chair in front of a TV, presumably playing Pets Cop, and Paul chooses his. Marvin says, quote, I'm coming, and soon after, the game idles. Bell's character enters the room and says, quote, I'm sorry, perhaps apologizing that Paul has suffered the same fate as her. I understand this is a little bit ambiguous. We're getting a little... I want to do at least skim the surface because, again, this goes very, very deep. Yeah, this is... But I'll help you. Deep. Yeah, but I'll help you with the conclusions. It seems that anyone who plays Pets Cop is either intended to die or just in some way becomes a part of the game itself. Either way, the game seems to have more control over itself than Paul has as the player. In one episode, Paul's game actually crashes, and when he restarts the game, his save file was completely replaced with a new file called Strange Situation. Strange Situation may be a reference to an experiment associated with attachment therapy, where an infant is placed in strange situations where the parents leave the room to see how or if they react to their caretaker returning. I do remember reading about this very, very early on in Weird. psychology class. It might be a reference, but I would be inclined to believe it is a reference mm -hmm. to this, given where the story kind of goes and some of the other things they reference. But what's creepy is that the game says you left, you crashed rather, and instead of losing the file or corrupting, it rewrites it. we just gave you a new one. Gave you a new one with everything we wanted it to have. I don't like that. Yeah. Would you like... I definitely like it would... It's a very... It's honestly hmm. like someone should build something that's like this. Yeah. This is very intriguing. Oof. There is a fan-made version of Petscop. I don't know how in-depth it is, if it has all these elements, like the crash and the right. demos and things, but I imagine it has at least some parts of that. But um, these are unique elements for sure. The company that created the game uh, Mortuary Assistant, where that video game is your, uh, you know, you're an assistant in Mortuary, and the, there's a demon in there. You have to figure out what body, find clues, all that kind of stuff. They're making a paranormal activity game, Ooh. which like, man, imagine you're playing the game and different things are happening to like yeah. save files yeah. and like imagine, I don't know, you know that shot paranormal activity. They're in the bedroom. The doors open in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Instead, like looking at the people in the bedroom, the ghost starts looking at you playing the game. Ooh. Like, yeah, oh, man, that's what I love about the games like modernized horror games is like they build on each other like amnesia might not have been them first but they did it really well where they introduced the sanity meter yeah. and based on how your sanity depletes your character's starting to lose it they're themselves scared so they're starting to see more things mm -hmm. you know and, and yep. more effects happen to you i just i a love those immersive way to games experience storytelling 100 yeah. percent. i love it now coming back to this kind of Little conclusion here about like the family and joining the game. Paul is apparently part of the family connected to Pets Cop since he has a room in the game. So are all the children of this family supposed to be part of the in-game family? Or does everyone who plays this game kind of become part of the family? Yeah. That's still up in the air. But the YouTube channel description changed once again in September of 2017 to add, quote, for now there is nothing to do. We are waiting patiently for Paul. When the time comes, we will turn on the light. So now Paul... Sounds like the tease for a big reveal. It does. But now, now Paul seems to be gone. He's no longer co-owning this thing. He seems to be... Yeah, Paul can't answer the phone right now. But if you leave a message, I might tell him. No. Yeah. It's... Paul will return as Paul. Yeah. What episode Let's Play is that then out of 24? Do we know? So if we're looking at September 2017, the last uploaded episode at that point would have been episode 10. Episode 11 was in December of 2017. Interesting. Wow. Interesting. Okay. We're bouncing around a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Because then there was another like two years, two months left in the storytelling. But 
All right. So wow. it could be that this family has always expected Paul. Perhaps he was kidnapped like the character Care. By the way, there's a lot of other details going on with Care, the character in the game. I believe there is Care A, Care B, and Care NLM, if I'm getting that correct. But there's subsets of Care. Care kind of changes as the story goes on. Again, I'm just trying to interest the task force and going right. even deeper because the, this thing goes... Up, yeah. We could be here for hours. This yep. one's so awesome. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm geeking out. But so more evidence that suggests that people become trapped in Petscop is the fact that when Belle plays, she doesn't have a quit button. There's a point where when she's in control of the game, it shows the, the controller on screen with yep. all the, like, this button does this, this button inputs, does this. Yeah. yeah, all the inputs. And her quit button is not labeled, therefore she does not have it. And the text on the screen seems to say that she has been playing for 17 years. You know when it says, like, your, your playtime is 130 hours. Yeah. Hers trying. is 17 years long, which seems to indicate that at some point 17 years ago, Belle as a person disappeared or began playing this game 17 years ago. And, and her stopped. And, like, again, was it her spirit imbibed into the game? Was it AI imitating her? In what way that, again, that's still the theory that's being discussed but that must be haunting when you're like, can't quit, and you've been playing 17 years. Jesus. Another theory within all this kind of says that maybe the players somehow get rebirthed into Pets Cop. Again, that is a big theme around this. And as I keep indicating, there is a criminal case that this Pets Cop story references. And we're going to go into detail on that in just a bit. But that also centers around rebirth. So... This kind of makes sense. Maybe you do get rebirthed into Petscop. Maybe that's how it's manifesting that theme. Though the process is not perfect because while Paul is still Paul in the game, Belle is not Tiara and Care is not Lena. Remember, these are all names that we kind of referenced and yeah. they all have kind of parallels to their real world counterpart, but not. Alternatively, the other side of the thing is that these happenings may all exist to make it seem like the game is haunted, to maybe do a little magician's sleight of hand, kind of look over here while something else is going on. But in one episode, we see a series of generations of players, inputs synced together, or possibly the result of generational algorithm. If the artificial intelligence of Petscop learned how Marvin and Bell played, it may learn how to act like them in the game. Ice Master, who runs Petscop Forensics, presented an interesting aspect that sort of combines the haunted and AI theories. They proposed digital immortality. So maybe somehow a person's consciousness can be uploaded into Petscop, and in Paul recording his gameplay, the family can see their deceased loved ones. Basically echoes of the past in the game, in the game. parallels from what happened in reality in the game. And maybe while playing it, the game is learning you so it can create a digital version of you to hit that kind of sense of immortality. Because you know, if you upload your brain into a computer, if that was ever real, yeah. that isn't you. That's just a copy yes. of, the, of the scan that they did at yep. that time. So it would firmly believe, I made it, I I'm digital now. Yeah, it's not. It ain't you. No, it's, it's, yeah. Just like if you get beamed up by Scotty, you die every time. Yeah, and then you just read, like your molecules are just copied and then uh -huh. put back together. Oh. Yeah, God, that's, you have all the memories, but you don't know that each terrifying. time you go, ah, but you get melted what if, apart. What if the, what if you survive and then you have two copies of you? That's a whole, like, that's yeah, a whole, whole arc. That's a whole thing. It's like, which one is the I real think that me? happened. Or it's like prestige. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you don't know which one. You never spoiler. know which one you're going to be. Yeah. The yeah. one dying or the one, oh, God, <laughs> dude, to do that every night. Yeah. Also... Uh, just a terrifying thought. Like, if this, you know, imagine playing this video game and it's, you know, uh, it's showing that it's real and it's um, real time and it knows these things, it's predicting these things. And then while you're playing the game, you die in the game and you just go, hold on. And then it just gives a date. Oh. Just go, uh, what? I don't like this. I'm gonna, I'm tell you what, I'm a Devin Sawa Final Destination, go find a cabin and then uh, bulletproof everything in that place. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what, what I'm gonna the, do. What was the woman who like went into a padded room, like yes. committed herself mm, to yeah. like, so she could never be harmed or something? Final Destination 2. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd go, what, what do they have to do? Witness childbirth or help a child be born? Oh, God. You're talking about like 
further no, it gets down way deeper. Final yeah, I Destination. Say, I don't remember that. That's, that's, that's when they start going, <laughs> like, only new six, life can yeah. beat death. Yeah, it's like five or six. Spoiler alert, it yeah, ain't like, gonna fix. Yeah. <laughs> they got weird with it. Yeah. I, okay. One Such more, a cool premise. One more Final Destination thought. <laughs> the hot dog... Uh, the grill, the hot dog uh, cookout, <laughs> okay, and the ambulance. Yeah, you remember that? Yes. <laughs> Wildly visceral, hilarious at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just so was sorry. it hot dog? Was the I, hot dog? Just, I was working, with hot dog. I was working my way to cookout. I, I had to like key myself up. I'm, like, found I'm going thought. hot dog. <laughs> hot dog. Period. The end. I was going like hmm, grass, blanket, sun, hot dog. <laughs> picnic. No nope. cookout. There it is. I had to play word association to get there. All right. So there's another kind of alternate theory here that I want to uh, kind of discuss before we move into the new maker connection. The name new maker has been all over this episode yes. and with reason. So another alternative is that Paul is able to time travel while playing Petscop or the game in some way is able to converge different timelines. It's a little hairy, but perhaps Petscop is somehow able to connect 2017 to 1997. And maybe that's why you see they've been playing for 17 years, because there also is a reference to 2000 in the descriptions. But Paul is able to talk to Bell on the phone, but maybe the in-game Bell is from a different timeline. So now, you know, we got multiple God, universes happening. The science behind that. Yeah. So whatever the case, Petscop seems to blend real lives of these characters with the fictional lives and the universe of Petscop. With that said, that is kind of... I would say even just, even still a cursory glance at the lore, the storytelling behind it, the unfiction angle, the haunted paranormal side behind it. But with that said, I do want to dive into the case that's referenced very heavily up through the first right. 10 episodes. I do this mostly because the author themselves admitted to to having done this. And they even said that it was a stupid mistake. It was because oh, they, they regret it. Yeah, because they wanted to activate this actual scenario for the sake of the themes that it carried, but they didn't mean for this to inadvertently be about that case. Okay. So they used names, themes, and references purely as a thematic thing, and that's why they were like, that was a mistake, that was stupid. Yeah, I went I, too far. I went too far by doing that, and it yeah. because it's a very dark case, mm. unfortunately, so... While Petscop was ongoing, many viewers theorized that the series may be about the real child named Candace Newmaker. The player is told that they are, quote, the Newmaker by Tool, that kind of weird shaped polygon guy. And the secret section of the game is called the Newmaker Plane, as opposed to the above ground gift plane that we talked about earlier. So Candace Newmaker's life is referenced up until episode 10. Candace was born Candace Tiara Elmore to a teenage mother and an abusive father in North Carolina. Eventually, Candace and her siblings were taken by CPS, and when she turned five, her birth parents lost all parental rights. In 1996, Candace was adopted by a pediatric nurse practitioner, Jean Elizabeth Newmaker, and her name was changed to Candace Elizabeth Newmaker. In Petscop, adoption is at the surface level, and characters have their name changed. Again, a lot of themes in this Petscop story, and a lot of them do attach to this case, and we'll talk about the creator's response in a second, but Candace did relatively well in school, but her adopted mother complained of her behavior at home, though the specifics of her behavior are unclear. Jean took Candace to multiple doctors, therapists, and tried multiple drugs, such as antidepressants, antipsychotics, etc. Jean at some point attended a seminar on, quote, attachment therapy, and described Candace to certified therapist William Goebel. Goebel believed Candace's case to be severe without meeting her, and suggested Jean seek out an expert in attachment, Connell Watkins. It's unknown if Jean was aware Watkins was actually unlicensed at the time, so we're already laying a dark oh, groundwork here for this that's particular. Not good. Oh no, none of this is good. <laughs> this is all very terrible. Um, Candace had a very unfortunate, and as you'll see, short life. So, Jean brought Candace to a two-week-long therapy session in Evergreen, Colorado, with Watkins and her team. One of the therapies Watkins administered was called quote rebirthing. Now, this is a pretty sinister thing that has since been made illegal in Colorado and North Carolina, and it's actually referred to as Candace's Law, but I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but of course, rebirth has been one of the themes pretty openly yes, in, in Petscop. So, this rebirthing was administered on April 19th in the year 2000. So, again, rebirth, common theme in Petscop. In the Quitter's Room, for example, there's a sign that says, quote, do you remember being born? 
This is considered therapeutic practice by therapists who follow, quote, attachment therapy, but full transparency, this is a highly dangerous and unproven technique that should not be performed. Again, it has been made illegal in both the states of Colorado and North Carolina. I didn't even think about just therapy in that way. Like, yeah. it could be weird kind of, like, techniques or shock therapy, stuff oh, like yeah. that. There's some gnarly things. You can rewire the brain. Yeah. It, yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. That's terrifying. So... To go a little bit deeper before we pull ourselves back out here, in this archaic procedure, Candace was wrapped in flannel sheets and covered with pillows while Watkins and her team pushed and pulled against Candace as she tried to get out. Again, as we continue, a lot of the sensitive themes are in the description, but this is admittedly a pretty dark case. The intention was to simulate that kind of feeling of being reborn to Jean, to kind of instill upon her an actual sense of rebirth, but sadly, In this procedure, if you can call it that, Candace suffocated. As she fought to get out, Watkins asked if she wanted to be reborn, to which she uttered her last words, no. They taunted Candace, called her a quitter. Things like that uh, have been referenced as the quitter's room, for example. It's, It's, again, very, very dark. But the character on the mirrored side of the room that we talked about earlier, where the player Paul enters the room and there's a mirror and there's a kind of person kind of emulating his moves on the other side, The character in this mirrored room, or at least on the mirrored side, is called Tiara, and that's like Candace's original middle name. And Belle, the character, was supposed to be the name of Candace's favorite toy. So eventually, a a lot of people drew these connections, and Tony revealed himself to be the creator of Petscop, and he said that Petscop was not supposed to be about Candace Newmaker, but intentionally kind of included these references yeah. to her story for the sake of the themes. You're still dancing around it. Happily. Right. Oh, very sure. And in that tweet that he made to kind of say, yes, I did do this intentionally. He also said, quote, extremely stupid of me to kind of have done that because it is such a delicate and sensitive case. And he didn't, their, their intent was not to make light of it yeah. by making it part of their, their art but rather to kind of activate some of those themes that are present in this kind of case. So after episode 10, there's way less, if not any more, overt references to Candace as Tony felt it was wrong to have included it in the first place and did not want to make light of her tragic story. But again, kind of wrapping all of Petscop up, this is a very deep and nebulous and nuanced. There's a lot of details. There's a lot to it. And a lot of visuals. A lot of visuals. So it's it's kind of like one of those cases that we kind of just scratched the surface, but we did kind of want to explore as much as possible. And um, Task Force, if this is a case that you're even more fascinated in, there are people that have many hours worth of video essays out there that you can really go deep on. I know Jillian and I kind of watched a bunch of those just to try to get a fuller grasp on everything. And it, and it really is so hard to grasp. So if you feel at the end of this episode that you're still kind of like, I'm not sure if I fully understand it. That's normal. That's how I felt after watching like just one video essay on it. Mm-hmm. So it is a wild topic, but it's one of those ones that kind of melds a little bit of traditional true crime with the internet, with storytelling in that unfiction sense. Right. Uh, morbidly fascinating for sure. Yeah, it's a very interesting one and it hits close to home because it's just, it's, you know, it's based off video games. This has been a huge part of, I mean, both our lives um, since we were young. So. To be able to see a let's play in kind of this uh, in this light is is a new type of genre I never thought existed. You yeah. know what I mean? Just uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you think about video games, you think about something that's like played by the masses. Sure, you have some games that are mature rated, but still you have hundreds of thousands of people playing those games. And then this one was very direct very singular experience that was exposed to many other people and uh yeah it puts it puts video games in a darker light which you don't really see yeah yeah it also activates video games as a kind of platform for storytelling it does and then also like the unique blend of games not only games but let's plays on youtube as this really interactive way to tell unfiction but i'm really happy we covered this one it is one of the kind of first actual unfiction less arg centric types of stories we've we've talked about mm-hmm. but that is petscop 
That's a beefy one. It's a beefy one. That's a beefy, that's a beefy boy. I'm looking over at Jillian and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> She's got her head in her hands. Uh, went down the rabbit hole in this one, no? Oh, oh, big time. Oh, big time. It was bad. Yeah. I'm a fan now, so. 100%. All right, Fredo. Well, with Petscop up on our, our wall of topics that we've covered. We do have a wall now, by the way. I've printed out a picture of every single one, and I've got them all framed up nicely in museum glass, so UV rays can't get to them and age those photos. Um, with that up on the wall, I'll see you next week for another mystery. <laughs> <laughs>